Okay, thanks for that introduction, and um, also thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, before I get started, I just want to encourage you guys uh, to speak up if I say something that's overly jargony. I'm a behavioral ecologist and bioacoustician, so um, my, my, the language I use may not be uh, immediately transferable to, to um, you know, what is largely more, a, a, um, as I understand, more anthropological background. So uh, feel free to, to interrupt me and ask questions. So the study of geographic variation in animal signals has long been an important focus of evolutionary biologists because geographic patterns can reveal important um, clues about the underlying evolutionary forces at work that uh, structure such variation. Now discrete breaks in signals um, known as dialects among um, animals that acquire their uh, their signals through learning um, are of particular interest because learned signals have the potential to evolve extremely rapidly through the process of cultural transmission. Now, among human cultures, dialects are pretty ubiquitous and have been the target of intense study by linguists because dialects provide important insights into historical, social, and political relationships among groups of individuals but also because dialects can themselves play an important role in mediating social interactions both within and between groups. Dialects are also pretty common among non-human animals that acquire their vocalizations through learning, particularly in birds and whales. And they can occur between populations on a regional scale all the way down to within social groups on a microgeographic scale. And these microgeographic dialects um, have been a popular focus for behavioral ecologists uh, because as in studies of human dialects, dialects at this scale may both reflect and impact the social relationships among individuals within a population. Now after decades of research, a large portion of studies um, investigating the function of dialects in birds have come to the general consensus that microgeographic dialects may arise as an epiphenomenon or a side effect um, of the use of shared songs by uh, males in territorial negotiations. But there is a potential problem with this uh, conclusion. The vast majority of species that have been uh, studied to address whether dialects may serve some sort of socially adaptive function have been conducted in territorial and socially monogamous songbirds, or the Ossine passerines. Now, if we wish to test the generality of models um, explaining the existence of uh, non-human dialects, we really have to broaden our scope to include other taxa with other mating systems. And of particular interest are lecking species. Species with lek mating systems are those in which males aggregate into groups where they compete vigorously for access uh, to females who visit the group solely for the purpose of mating. Dialects have been described in a number of lek mating species, um, such as my study species, the little hermit. Um, yet, unfortunately, they've only really been the uh, target of, of descriptive studies, or the uh, subject of descriptive studies. But why should we care whether dialects occur on, on leks? What's the point? Um, is there anything special about leks that might make us predict that dialects might serve some sort of novel function on them. Well, the intense sexual selection uh, that's typical of lek mating systems is thought to have resulted in a diverse radiation of mating and mate searching tactics um, and strategies in many lekking species. So for instance, a number of species, um, in a number of species it's uh, been described that males on leks may aggregate with kin and obtain inclusive fitness benefits by helping a dominant relative to mate, or may benefit by uh, directing uh, aggression away from, from kin and towards non-relatives. Males can also form cooperative coalitions, such as in the lance-tailed mannequin, um, where they form cooperative and very complicated coordinated displays to attract mates. And, um, Males may also use a bewildering array of deceptive mating tactics, um, such as using female-like plumage and um, vocal mimicry um, to gain access to mates. 
So the question I set out to answer was whether any of these or other mating tactics and adaptations might help explain the existence of dialects on Lex. But put more generally, my goal in carrying out my dissertation work was to understand the adaptive significance of dialects on Lex using a uh, Lex mating hummingbird, uh, the little hermit, um, as my model organism. Now the way I've structured the talk is first to just introduce you to the basic natural history of this, of this bird. Um, and then I'm going to explain how I actually quantified dialects and dialectal variation. Um, I'll then dive into addressing potential ways uh, in which female choice and male-male competition may have led to the evolution of dialects in the species. Um, and then I'll summarize my results and discuss sort of the broader implications uh, of my findings for the evolution of vocal learning. So the little hermit is a rainforest understory trap liner. Um, that is, they go from flower to flower rather than defending flower resources. And they breed seasonally on Lex uh, in Trinidad and Venezuela. Between January and May, males aggregate on traditional display grounds, the Lex, where they produce a single song type that's iterated many, many times throughout the day for many months at a time. They're doing it right now as we speak. Um, and as I've already alluded to, the structure of the song isn't uniform across individuals on the lek, but instead is structured into these discrete dialects. And males use these songs to uh, defend territories and to attract mates um, to their display perches. But once they've done that, once they've attracted a female, they'll perform this visual display um, that precedes copulation. And as is typical of lek mating systems, uh, females visit the lek solely for the purpose of mating. They build nests and raise uh, young completely independently. Okay, so before we can talk about the possible adaptive significance of, of dialects uh, in this species, it's important to be clear that there actually are dialects and that we can robustly define and measure them. Um, and First, just to give you a sense for the, um, the variation in songs in the species, um, I'll, I'm going to play an example of a song from several inter individuals recorded on one of my core leks in Trinidad. Now, if you were to walk up this path um, on my field site, in only a few steps, you'd hear the following seven birds. OK, so you might have noticed that the first five songs I played all sounded alike, and the last two sounded different from that first group. And this is what I'd call a sharp dialect boundary. Um, but it's important to find a way to actually quantify this variation so we can study it objectively. A large number of studies, I'd say the majority, um, examining dialectal variation in non-human animals actually fail to test whether vocal variation is in fact dialectal um, or characterized by these sharp transitions between localities. And this can be pretty dangerous because the evolutionary processes leading to clinal or gradual variation may be really distinct from that leading to these abrupt transitions or discrete clusters. This failure to test whether um, vocal variation is dialectal isn't really surprising, though, because existing analysis tools, acoustic analysis tools, are a little problematic. Probably the most common technique to do this, to, to evaluate whether there are dialects, is finding eager volunteers to sort through piles of spectrograms or graphical representations of sound over time and to assign them to groups based on their visual similarity. But this process is slow, it's really subject to bias, and it's not uh, particularly repeatable, and it can be very imprecise. Um, another technique involves the use of multivariate statistics to measure multiple acoustic um, measures, or to analyze multiple acoustic measures. And although this technique is less subject to bias, the choice of acoustic measures is often arbitrary, um, and it can be particularly problematic when signals are extremely dissimilar. You don't know which measurements to make that are comparable. 
Um, so to circumvent many of these issues, uh, I therefore chose to analyze vocal variation um, in the Little Hermits using a technique um, used uh, in human voice recognition um, known as dynamic time warping. Uh, despite the cosmic sounding name and lots of scary equations uh, and about 10,000 lines of MATLAB code, um, it's actually a pretty simple technique that has a number of advantages over commonly used techniques. Um, so one of the reasons that traditional analysis techniques uh, tend to be really imprecise is that they're overly sensitive to the temporal differences um, in signals that are otherwise very uh, similar structurally. Um, so for instance, if we compare these two fairly similar uh, signals by simply sliding one over the other, um, you may know this as spectral cross-correlation, if you do any sound analysis. Um, uh, the, these don't really overlap particularly well, um, despite the similarity in their shape. Dynamic time warping, um, however, finds an optimal alignment um, in time, and then warps one with respect to the other in time, so that the, the similarity in those signals can be better represented. Now, a particular advantage of this technique is that it allows for the simultaneous inclusion of multiple different um, acoustic parameters and for those parameters to be weighted with respect to one another to better match um, results from psychoacoustic studies. So that those, those measure, the measure of acoustic distance more closely re resembles the perceptual distance between those signals. Okay, so there's a great deal more to this technique that I can really get into at this, at this point, but the uh, result is an automatically generated um, dialect assignment um, that involves as little subjectivity as I think is possible. And as you can see from a map of male territories on one of my lecs with dialect assignments overlaid, um, dialects are actually fairly well defined spatially. Um, and although there are occasional birds who are singletons, um, membership of a dialect um, seems to be the, the rule, at least for the birds in my, uh, that I've monitored on my field site. Okay, so now that I have a way to actually quantify dialectal variation, we can test hypotheses about their potential significance, their adaptive significance. Um, now in lecking species, the typically high uh, variance in reproductive skew, um, that is who, male, who mates and who doesn't, um, both between the sexes and within them, um, can lead to the operation of very intense sexual selection through two primary channels. The first is through intense competition among males on the lek for access to preferred breeding territories. And second, through the evolution of female choosiness in the evaluation of males. So any complete analysis of the adaptive significance of dialects um, really has to look for explanations from both of these avenues. And for the purposes of the talk, um, I'm first addressing how female choice might relate. Um, before we can go into investigating the role of female choice in any mating system, um, there are certain methodological obstacles you have to overcome, um, and that's especially the case in working with one of the world's smallest birds. Um, so first, obviously you have to capture these things, um, and that can be pretty challenging. Um, and I need, to mark, I need to be able to mark them and genetically sample them. So your typical uh, method for catching birds looks a little bit like this. Someone will go out, uh, you'll, you'll have a, a field crew gather around a tarp, processing birds as, a, as they come in, and someone will go out and check mist nets periodically for birds that have very conveniently gotten themselves caught. Um, hummingbirds, however, um, are notoriously good at avoiding mist nets. Um, and in my first year, I managed to catch only seven birds uh, after a month of constant mist netting. Um, so, Although it took me some time to perfect, uh, I ended up with a less traditional approach with much better results. <laughs> the, the grunting is necessary or else the birds don't uh, go in the right direction. So. Um, so at this point, my assistants and I have scared about 400 birds um, into nets after many, many hours of holding still, getting bitten by mosquitoes. Um, okay, so once I'd actually captured a bird, I'd then need to mark it. 
Now, an interesting feature of most birds are um, appendages known as legs. Um, and those serve as useful locations for putting color marks, uh, in, in uh, this case, color bands. Um, so hummingbirds seem not to really have gotten the memo on the utility of visible legs. Um, so I had to devise a new marking technique that um, took a couple of years to perfect, but allowed me to identify individuals without having to constantly recapture them every year. Um, so eventually, with four lecks of fully marked individuals, my field assistants and I could conduct behavioral observations to quantify individual singing, mating, and fighting behavior, um, and to obtain high-quality recordings of their songs. Um, now, any study investigating the role of female choice um, in signal evolution obviously depends on having a really accurate measure of reproductive success. Um, but unfortunately, out of almost 3,000 hours of observation, um, my assistants and I observed a grand total of four copulations uh, across about 100 individuals. Um, so it became apparent that I was going to need a different approach for actually estimating success, reproductive success. Um, I therefore started looking for nests so that I could estimate success through an analysis of paternity, but um, over the course of about 500 hours of, of nest searching over three years, I still had found, I'd st found no nests. Um, and that, of course, called for um, some drastic, uh, drastic measures. <laughs> and I decided that radio tracking females to their nests might offer a solution. But there were two pro small problems um, with that. Um, first, little hermits weigh about uh, the same as, as a penny. And for them to be able to carry t uh, tags, those tags would have to weigh about 5% of, of the, the weight of a penny. Um, and that's basically Lincoln's hair. Um, and no radio tag existed. Um, that was that light. So I had to make one myself. Um, the second problem was that I'm a biologist, not an electrical engineer. Um, and my understanding of engineering could be nicely summarized by this XKCD cartoon. That is, basically, I had no understanding whatsoever. Um, but with the help of a lot of time, a giant book on electronics, and a couple of existing um, tag designs, I was able to learn enough to create um, a radio tag that's uh, currently still the world's smallest transmitter, uh, active transmitter. Um, of course, that's not the end of the story. Um, it took quite a number of tries to actually begin finding nests uh, because hermits don't have external morphological features that indicate when they're in breeding condition. I would often put a tag on a bird and follow it for five hours only to discover it at night roosting on a perch without a nest. Um, but one day in 2011, while I was tracking a female, the radio signal started getting stronger and stronger as I approached this slope of ferns. The clouds parted and a ray of sunshine illuminated in front of me this beautiful, immaculate um, nest dangling from the tip of a, of a fern frond. And inside were two perfect little data points. And uh, I came back the next day and uh, the eggs were gone. <laughs> And this, they were likely eaten by a snake. And this was something that happened over and over and over that first year. Um, but rather than call it a day, um, <laughs> I decided I was going to find a way to collect eggs from nests, replace them with plastic replicas so that females would continue to incubate. And then um, I would incubate those eggs artificially um, in an incubator back in the field station. And I'd obtain a genetic sample and return the chicks once they, once they hatched, uh, as long as the nest was still active. So in this way, I was able to go from zero nests in three years to around 100 in a single year. So sometimes persistence pays off. Um, and then I spent another year painstakingly developing the genetic tools to actually conduct the paternity analysis on these samples. So after all this, I was finally able to assign 54 offspring to sires on four leks on the field site. Now that number 54 um, is clearly not an exact exhaustive list of all of the offspring um, for that season, but if you look at the skew and success across males in all four of, of the leks, the core leks that I was studying, um, the fact that a number of males were assigned to more than one offspring, and in one case up to seven, um, aren't argues pretty strongly that this sample may be 
pretty representative of the relative success between birds. Um, so at that point, I was finally armed with both the behavioral and reproductive success data that I might need to investigate female mate choice uh, in my population. Okay, so how might um, female choice relate to the evolution of dialects on Lex? Well, I've developed three non-exclusive hypotheses for this. Um, and although I'll explain the details as I get to them, I want to first note that the first two hypotheses posit that females are actually paying attention uh, or evaluating male quality using song structure. Whereas in the third, they're just using song structure as a uh, marker of identity. So before I get into the details, uh, it's important to give you a little bit of background about how song might actually relate to quality. Now, quite simply, for any trait to be an accurate indicator of quality, there has to be some cost involved in producing that trait, which ensures its honesty, such that only high-quality individuals are capable of producing a high-quality uh, signal, in this case, a song. Well, the study of the neural and physiological mechanisms of avian song acquisition and production have identified uh, five general features um, of song that might be really costly to produce. Those are the ability to maximize repertoire size or diversity, to produce songs over and over with, with high consistency, to copy uh, song structure accurately from tutors, uh, to maximize both the speed and bandwidth of uh, vocalizations, um, and to simultaneously maximize amplitude and length of the vocalizations. And for clarity, I'm just going to call this performance. Um, and all of these features have been demonstrated to be under selection by females. Um, in my species, they have a single song type and don't produce uh, rapid trills, so neither of these are, are relevant. Um, okay, so now that we have a basic idea of the uh, potential song quality measures that females might be paying attention to, let's return to the question of how females might be actually using dialects to assess male quality. So first, females, oops, uh, first females may be using um, the shared songs between males in the same dialect to facilitate comparative assessment of male song quality. Studies across a range of taxa have revealed that um, females may select mates um, through evaluation of the relative quality of males that she's sampled, rather than comparing males to some internal standard. And this best of n search tactic has also been identified in a number of lecking species. And indeed, a number of researchers have suggested that a specific advantage of lex um, is that the close proximity of males may help facilitate comparisons among them. However, if the male trait um, is, uh, that females are using to make comparisons are any of the song quality measures I outlined a minute ago, there, uh, there could be a problem. Several studies have provided evidence that factors such as differences in pitch and song structure can actually obscure the evaluation of uh, uh, song performance. Um, essentially, what this means is that when song types uh, differ, females may be unable to compare their relative quality. It's sort of the classic problem of comparing apples to oranges. Um, dialects that might therefore uh, reflect selective pressure by females to s essentially standardize their songs, for males to standardize their songs, to facilitate the comparison of song quality metrics like consistency, accuracy, and performance. Now, if that hypothesis is true, we might expect that males with less accurate copies of a song would have reduced success relative to other males in their dialect group. Um, and for the rest of the talk, any time I present a result, I'm first going to show you um, a, a, a model um, graph uh, indicating the expected results, followed by a graph of the observed results below it. So the results of a linear model um, comparing the inaccuracy, in this case, of song copying with relative uh, number of offspring sired in that dialect group shows no relationship. Um, 
I similarly, pre similarly predicted that uh, as consistency of song copying went, or sorry, a similarity in consistency in song went down, that males would suffer reduced reproductive success compared to their dialect mates, and again, found no relationship. Uh, finally, I expected that as the amplitude performance of songs increased among males within the dialect group, that their relative perform their relative success would also increase, and that also was not the case. So there doesn't appear to be um, evidence that females are using dialects to facilitate comparisons, but relative comparison isn't the only way that females might be using dialects to identify high quality individuals. Dialects might um, instead serve as uh, multi-male vocal phenotypes um, that aid in the identification identification of groups containing um, males of high average quality. Now evidence of female choice of multi-male phenotypes has been identified most clearly in two species of Chyrexiphia mannequins, where females assess the joint phenotype of cooperative male displays. Um, first in long-tailed mannequins, um, it's been demonstrated that uh, females prefer pairs of males who have these long-term associations that can produce a duet vocalization that's highly coordinated in frequency. And recent work in lance-tailed mannequins shows that uh, the coordination, the level of, of coordination of the visual display between um, the male partners actually increases when females are watching. And that suggests that this may be under some form of, of selection by females. Now, although mannequins aren't thought to learn their songs, a similar phenomenon involving song learning um, may be uh, occurring among territorial songbirds. Um, so specifically, it's been demonstrated that females prefer males that sing songs that most closely match, um, or that, that closely match their, their neighbors. And because a female can't know whether an individual served as a tutor or a pupil, um, this assessment may have to occur at the level of the group. So in this way, little hermit females may use dialect level features of song to identify groups of high quality males. And since the ability to copy song accurately uh, may be related to male quality, the average accuracy of learning of di a dialect group um, may serve as an indicator of the average quality of the individuals within that group. So for this group of males on the left, um, with highly accurate copies of one another's songs, it may pay for a female to limit her search for a mate to this, to this group and avoid that group on the right. Now if that hypothesis is true, we should expect that as average song copying accuracy decreases among the members of a dialect, um, that the per capita success of that group should also go down. Um, now, each point on this graph represents the, um, an individual dialect, um, and on the x-axis is the song dispersion, which is sort of the um, inverse of accuracy. Um, so it's basically how inaccurate average song copying is in that group um, compared to per capita offspring sired. And I found no evidence for a relationship between those two factors uh, in the 19 dialects that I analyzed. So I therefore have little evidence that females assess dialects as multi-male phenotypes. And more generally, um, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that any accepted measure of song quality um, is used in the assessment of male quality. But perhaps the structure of a male's song might be an indicator of that male's identity as a member of a group rather than his quality per se. Um, and along these lines, the, my third hypothesis posits that song may actually serve as an indicator of that male's position um, in a spatial cue for dominance. Now, cues for dominance have been identified in a number of lecking species, including black grouse, antelope, and several um, mannequin species. And as dominant males at the top of the hierarchy die, um, younger males arrive at the bottom, and males rise in status over time and increase their reproductive success through uh, female preference for males of high dominance. And in some species, um, it's been demonstrated that hierarchies, these dominance hierarchies, are also spatially explicit. 
And generally what this means is that as central males, that central males tend to be um, high ranking um, and peripheral males move towards the center over time. However, Lex often don't contain just a single center. Uh, and indeed in little hermits, uh, males appear to move towards the center, over time they move towards the center of their dialect group rather than the center of the lek. So females may, pay, may benefit by um, attending to dialects as an indicator that would show that this male is not actually central, that um, he, if he arrived and copied other individuals in, in this dialect group, he's actually very peripheral and may be uh, young or uh, subordinate. So if females are using dialect membership uh, as a cue to a male's dominance, then um, uh, with respect to other males in his dialect group, we would predict that distance from the center of the lek as a whole wouldn't relate to the number of offspring he sired. But that as you got further and further away from the center of your dialect, that your, your relative number of offspring would, would go down. Now, as expected, there's no relationship with uh, distance from the center of the lek as a whole on number of offspring sired. And although I found um, a slight negative trend uh, in the expected direction uh, with distance from the center of the dialect uh, leading to reductions in, in offspring, it's not a robust uh, effect and it's not particularly strong. Um, so I don't have strong evidence that, uh, ser that uh, song serves as a spatial cue uh, of dominance. And more generally, um, it doesn't appear that there's evidence that uh, female choice selects for dialectal variation um, directly. And at this point, um, I was getting pretty nervous uh, about not having any positive results after all that work uh, in my dissertation, uh, my dissertation work. Um, but remember, so far, we've only um, discussed half the story, because male-male uh, competition may play an extremely important role in male fitness on Lex. So we need to consider that perspective as well. So in many territorial songbirds, uh, shared songs among neighbors are thought to play an extremely important role in male-male uh, competition, specifically with regard to the establishment of territorial boundaries. Um, and it's been hypoth hypothesized to be a major factor uh, in the formation of microgeographic dialects. Now, one of several hypotheses for um, how song sharing may function uh, in male-male competition is the deceptive mimicry hypothesis. And under it, males use shared song um, uh, to identify territorial neighbors. And because these males have already negotiated their territorial boundaries, um, they're likely to exhibit low aggression towards one another, which is known as the dear enemy effect. An intruding male could benefit from the scenario by copying the song of an existing territory ho holder and using that song to deceive other neighbors into treating that male like a dear enemy. Now this uh, hypothesis has been tested by uh, Wilson and Verikamp in Song Sparrows, and they found that there's basically no evidence for this effect. And um, there's actually almost no strong support for this, this hypothesis in any species for which it's been studied. And so it's generally fallen out of favor. The last time it was tested was 2001. So there may be reason to believe, however, that uh, deceptive song mimicry could play an important role in male-male competition in lek mating systems. First, gaining access to a lekking territory might be the only way that a lekking male can obtain reproductive opportunities. And that could lead to extreme selection for territory establishment tactics. Um, second, song in little hermits generally consists of a single type, and that makes the task of uh, mimicry and deception a great deal easier than if there were some large repertoire that needed to be replicated. And in all lek mating species um, that learn their vocalizations, those vocalizations necessarily must be learned off the lek. I mean, I'm sorry, once they come back onto the lek, post-dispersal. Um, and that sets the stage for males to learn um, the songs of future neighbors where they intend to settle. And fourth, Territory disputes 
um, can be extremely dangerous. Added to the potentially high costs of not obtaining a territory on the lek, in Little Hermits the process of um, territory establishment itself can be extremely dangerous um, as males attempt to actually stab each other uh, with their bills or to exhaust one another's energetic reserves um, through really lengthy chases. So applied to lek mating systems, the deceptive mimicry hypothesis states that males recruiting to leks may use shared songs to deceive existing um, neighbors about their residency status. Dialects then would result as an epiphenomenon of the widespread use of this tactic by recruiting males. Okay, so to test the predictions of this hypothesis, I designed a playback experiment to evaluate the response of a focal male to simulated intrusions of males with varying degrees of similarity and familiarity to the focal bird. Um, to do this, I first set up a speaker on the border of the, um, a border between the two territories of the focal bird and a randomly chosen bird I'll call the focal neighbor. And then I played in random order and on different days one of five treatments, always from the same location. First, the song of the focal, the focal neighbor uh, as a control. The song of a different neighbor representing an intrusion from a familiar bird with the same dialect. The song of a deceased dialect member that the focal had no familiarity with representing an intruding mimic. Um, the song of a deceased bird from a different dialect representing an unfamiliar non-mimic. And the song of a foreign bird similarly uh, representing a non-mimic. So I measured uh, the, each focal bird's response to playback in two different ways. First, whether he responded at all, um, and that could serve as an indicator of whether the bird was uh, potentially fooled by this simulated deception or simulated, simulated mimicry. Uh, and second, I measured how long it took for the bird to actually begin responding. And you can think of this as the time it took for the bird to figure out that the playback was not his actual neighbor. Um, so the first prediction of this hypothesis is that uh, individuals will show a dear enemy response to neighbors since that's the only hypothesized benefit that uh, an intruder could actually obtain from, um, from mimicry. So if this prediction is true, then the, this binary response to playback, that is whether the bird noticed the, um, the, the simulated intrusion at all, um, it should be elevated for the foreign male playback and low for the control. Um, and indeed, there is a strong uh, effect in the expected direction with the focal males more likely to respond to uh, foreign male playback. Um, we might also predict that there would, it would require less time for an individual to respond or to mount a response um, to the foreign male playback. And it was also, also um, supported by the, the results. So there appears to be support for a dear enemy effect. Um, the, second, uh, the second prediction we have to consider is whether this uh, dear enemy effect is actually due to individual recognition of neighbors. So if males are capable of individual recognition, regardless of song sharing, um, then there's little prospect that an intruder would actually be capable of effective deception. Um, so if little hermits don't recognize um, individuals, then the playback of a neighbor from the wrong location um, should not evoke an elevated response with respect to the control. So it should be treated like a dear enemy. Um, so although there, and this is just the graphical representation of that. Um, so although there is a slight increase in the response uh, to the intruding neighbor, this isn't uh, statistically significant, and it's also far lower than the response to that foreign uh, playback. Um, and those same results are borne out by the latency measures, um, a slight increase that's not statistically significant for this intruding neighbor. Um, so there's little indication that males are actually using individual recognition to identify intruders. And that sets the stage for the use of song as a deceptive signal. Now, the third prediction is key, and that's that 
the effectiveness of mimicry depends vitally on sharing the same dialect as neighbors. Um, so specifically, I predicted that the playback of an unfamiliar mimic would evoke low levels of aggression, and an unfamiliar non-mimic should evoke a strong response as it's recognized as an intruder. So we'd expect the likelihood of response to look something like this, with the mimic evoking low responses and the non-mimic elevated responses. And this is, uh, the results look fairly similar to what we'd expect. And you might notice that the mimic has a slightly elevated um, response, or the focal individuals have a slightly elevated response to the mimic treatment. Um, and this is, although I won't have time to get into it, um, this is actually an indication that males are sensitive to the degree of accuracy of mimicry. Um, and again, the latency, uh, the predictions for latency uh, are also uh, supported um, in, in this test. So I also have pretty strong support that the use of shared songs um, by intruding males has potential to deceive territory owners. Um, but there is a, um, a valid alternative explanation for these results, namely that unshared songs might simply represent, for whatever reason, a greater threat than shared songs. So an essential uh, distinguishing prediction of the deceptive mimicry hypothesis is that once an intrusion has been detected, um, subsequent responses will be unrelated to whether a song was shared or unshared with the focal neighbor. Um, so to test that, I conducted an another playback experiment uh, where I presented mimic and non-mimic stimuli simultaneously um, for, from locations where no neighboring bird was currently holding a territory. And that created, created a scenario, oops, that created a scenario where it would be clear um, that a bird was an intruder regardless of the composition of his song. So if song sharing actually uh, reflected a male's intention to cooperate, for instance, um, with dialect members, then we might expect that uh, focal birds would tend to attack the speaker playing the unshared song um, over the shared song. However, if um, males considered any new bird uh, to be an intruder and a threat, then the responses ought to be equal between the treatments. Um, so first thing we might predict is that the probability to respond would be equal, and that's essentially what I found. There's no significant difference between the mimic and non-mimic treatments. Um, more importantly, we'd also predict that uh, the duration of response or its intensity would be equal between both treatments. And again, that is the case. There's no significant difference between treatments, um, which suggests that shared song is an inherently less threatening. So this final prediction of the deceptive mimicry hypothesis is also supported. Once an intrusion's been detected, it's attacked aggressively regardless of its structure. Okay, so although there's little support for the use uh, of female choice in uh, selecting for dialects, um, it appears that there's strong support that uh, dialects may reflect uh, an epiphenomenon of males using deceptive song mimicry as they compete for access to lek territories. Okay, I'd like to just take a quick minute now and briefly summarize what I've shown you. Um, first, I've shown you that dialects on little hermit leks um, can't be explained by female choice for dialectal variation. And specifically, uh, it appears that females aren't using leks to facilitate comparison of male song quality they're not using dialects to, uh, uh, the dialects don't serve as multi-male phenotypes. Um, and dialects aren't used by uh, females in the assessment of male dominance. Second, I basically demonstrated that dialects may result from male-male competition uh, in which deceptive mimicry of LEC residents helps to facilitate recruitment of males to the LEC. And this represents the first strong evidence uh, for the deceptive mimicry hypothesis. But if you take nothing else away, just remember that uh, hermits are liars. Um, okay, so I'd like to take a step back now and place these findings in the broader context of the study of sexual selection. So first, 
This study provides support for the often neglected idea that male-male competition for access to the LEC, and not just among LEC residents themselves, may be under strong selection. And secondly, um, this study, which is one of the first to identify the potential adaptive significance of song learning on LECs, has provided evidence that learning may have evolved to serve a very different function um, in LEC mating systems than in the more traditionally studied uh, monogamous mating systems. And finally, uh, the results of this study suggest that deceptive mimicry um, has potential to be more common on LECs than um, has been recognized previously. And that if that's the case, we might be underestimating the number of lecking species that actually learn their songs. Um, because we often assume that vocal homogeneity is uh, an indicator of the absence of learning, but precisely the opposite might be the case. Okay, so with that, I'd uh, like to thank my funding sources uh, and all of my field assistants over the years, uh, and to the hermits, and for you for your, your attention. Thank you. First off, thanks, this is super interesting. Um, I had a question about basically, you know, g given the sort of spatial composition of the lex mm -hmm. and that males are being recruited to lex and thus have to undergo sort of post dispersal learning of the, you know, particular dialect that's appropriate for that lex. Mm -hmm. Do you see qualitative differences in those that? end up in peripheral territories that are at the borders of a dialect, uh, you know, at a, at a dialect boundary versus mm -hmm. on the periphery that has no other boundaries and whether or not, you know, plasticity and learning is playing a role in selecting for which group, go, you know, which male goes to like the border versus the sort of like un, uninhibited area. Do you mm -hmm. see, is there any data about that? Um, so th there's, several different avenues uh, related to, to what you're asking that, that I want to do and that, that I want to pursue in the, in the future. Um, regarding whether they um, are sort of open-ended in their learning and whether they, they might be learning multiple dialects and deciding which, which one to join and whether they can switch back and forth between those, um, uh, actually they can. Um, so when a male will recruit to, to the LEC, he'll actually spend about two weeks just silently, kind of creepily watching from, from bushes, not making a sound. Um, and there's a, a period um, in, in late May, basically, when there are just dozens of birds just sitting, staring, watching, watching all of these uh, adult birds. And then they disappear. And what they're doing is they, they've basically sampled all, uh, well, maybe not all, but at least some of the males on the lek, just sort of they're trying to figure out where they're going to, to um, uh, settle. And then they go off and practice the songs by themselves off in the forest. So while they're going through this period of, of basically babbling, um, they're honing that signal so that when they come back, it's basically uh, well-defined. Now, when a bird shows up and it gets attacked um, and is, is basically ousted from the location where it had intended to settle, um, so it had spent a couple of weeks and just was getting attacked so much that it ended up leaving, frequently those birds will switch their song um, after moving to a new location on the lek. So they do tailor what they end up singing um, to the location that they've, uh, to, to the location where they've arrived, what, what's the common song. Um, when they're on a boundary between two different dialects, they never create a hybrid song. There's never any like mixing of, of the, the two songs. Um, that does happen occasionally when a bird is switching songs from one, one song to another, but that only lasts for a, a, a brief period of time uh, as they're transitioning to the, to the new song. Um, so it really does seem like this binary choice. You either stick with the song you learned um, where you intended to settle, or you switch to another one completely. Um, and that open-ended learning um, doesn't last forever. They, they uh, can only seem to be, they only seem to be capable of doing this um, within the first year. Yeah. Thank you.
-hmm. So I have two questions. First, on the on the female preference for male dominance possibility, mm -hmm. it seems to me, and you might just have a power problem here, but um, the results that you presented were pooled across all of the dialects. Mm -hmm. But um, and you can tell me whether empirically this is correct or just a misimpression on, on my part. But your representation suggested that the dialects are not equally populous, so there's some that have more members than others. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, presumably the larger dialects are more informative with regard to dominance rank right. um, than mm -hmm. the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the yeah. stronger test would be whether you see that um, geographical preference uh, when females are selecting among the members of a large dialect mm -hmm. among the small. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very valid point um, because it's, it's going to be a lot easier to have a highly cohesive dialect when there's just one other individual, right, than, than if you have to match 15 other, other birds. Um, I have restricted the analysis to just dialects that are the same size um, and also not found a, a relationship. But then there is, uh, in addition to you know, doing it that way, there's also a power problem because you have so few um, that are matched in size. Um, but uh, doing it that way, there's definitely not a, a clear indication that females are, are paying attention to, to consistency uh, or, or song copying accuracy. Okay. Yeah. I, I had a second question, which was with regard to the deer enemy um, hypothesis. And one thing that confuses me, so you've demonstrated that there's no individual recognition, um, which would be necessary for that hypothesis to apply. But um, I'm confused as to how well, why isn't there, why isn't selection favored the ability to recognize when two identical songs are performed overlapping in time, but geographically distant, right? So if I'm mistaking, so I, I learn that this individual is my enemy and there's some endowment effect kind of thing going on where it's not worth trying to, to fight your territory because the costs are too high, both of us are just, acknowledge that individual and say, fine, okay, we're going to respect one another's territory, mm -hmm. right? And I, I know that individual's song, right? And that individual's song appears here and here simultaneously, uh -huh. Uh -huh. okay? You would think that there would be selection for the ability to recognize that those couldn't possibly be the same individual. Absolutely. Similarly, if two songs appear near each other but um, uh, not completely synchronous, mm -hmm. then you would think there'd be selection for me to recognize that those right. are not the same individual. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally different story if, you know, there's a song here, and then much later there's a song over there. Well, presumably that individual just flew just over flew there, there right. and I'm easily yeah. fooled by mm -hmm. two individuals. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if uh, either do they space their, their singing out temporally so that they don't overlap, right? Mm -hmm. Or do they cluster so closely together that it could be just one individual moving around quickly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very, very good point. Um, and there, there are a couple, I have a couple of answers for you. So um, first, these, these perches that these males use uh, to broadcast their song are um, very fixed. So a male may have two or three different perches and uses only <coughs> those. And these recruiting males know which perches the, those males are using. And so they'll often, and I, I quantified this, and I didn't include it in the presentation, but they, they will wait until the male leaves his territory and occupy that perch and start singing from it. And oftentimes when that, that other male, the resident male, comes back, um, he'll just chase that bird off and they'll go on this like hour-long chase with one another. Um, and so it seems like they're kind of masquerading while the other bird is, is absent, not, not home. Um, and so there is a spatial mimicry in addition to the acoustic mimicry. Um, the other thing is that these birds are basically equipped with weapons at the ends of their uh, faces, and they will actually stab one another and kill, kill each other in these fights. And almost all of the turnovers that I've seen have been preceded by fights um, with recruiting males. So when these young birds show up, they're not just sort of trying to eke their way, their, you know, insert themselves in between uh, existing territories, they'll actually go after and try to kill um, one male and pose as it. So you'll see one day they're fighting and then suddenly you have a P-51 
piece on the lek. And it just, if you didn't have them marked, you'd think, oh, that bird just gave up. But what actually happened is that bird most likely killed the one that was the resident and is now posing as it. It uses all the same perches, sings exactly the same song, and receives the same level of aggression, sort of background level of aggression from the other individuals on the LAC. Um, and that's not always the case. Sometimes you get birds that try and fail and just sort of um, glom onto the side of the LEC, and they often uh, end up getting a lot more aggression. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of the avenue that this, uh, this effect is, is uh, happening. Pretty nasty birds. <laughs> as cute as they are, they're really conniving. <laughs> more questions? Okay, well, if we have no more questions, well, thank you, Ian, very much.